Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ya Ali Madat. It is with great pleasure that I extend a warm welcome to you all in person to our first event in over two and a half years at the Smiley Center. It goes without saying as to how much has changed for us all in the interim period, both professionally and personally. And it is my hope that this networking event will be a great opportunity for you all to reconnect after an extended period of time communicating via video calls. Good evening also to everyone joining us online. The EPB has naturally been vigilant as to the developments in the UK as well as the wider European and global economy and is mindful of the growing economic challenges facing us all on both a commercial as well as a household level. The past few months have been turbulent, dominated by extraordinary geopolitical and macroeconomic events. Spiking inflation in food and energy, dislocations in the labor market, in leisure and hospitality, supply shortages of raw materials in the manufacturing and construction sectors. There is a really long list of hurdles facing businesses and households. In this rapidly changing backdrop, we have the great pleasure in welcoming our keynote speaker from KPMG, Denis Tatarkov, this evening to help unpick these complex questions for us and help us navigate uncertainty. Before I invite the President of the National Council for the United Kingdom, Noshad Jivraj, for some opening remarks, I would like to remind you all that Iftar is at 8.15 p.m. today, and we hope you will join us for some refreshments after the presentation. President Syed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, uh, leaders of the Jamaat, the KPMG team, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this evening's event, which has been organized by the Aga Khan Economic Planning Board, and also welcome to the Ismaili Center. As Rubina has just said, it's been a long, long time since we've had face-to-face uh, -face, um, uh, uh, meetings here at the, at the center. For the benefit of our guests who are visiting us for the first time here at the Ismaili Center, the center in London is a very special building, the first of its kind and only one of uh, six Ismaili centers around the world. It is a space for prayer, but also for dialogue, echoing His Highness the Aga Khan's words that these centers are to be places for contemplation and enlightenment. Subtly blending elements of Islamic architecture with the local built environment, the Ismaili centers are reflective of the ethos and value system of the Ismaili Muslim community worldwide. Perhaps I should spend a few moments to explain a little about the Ismailis. We are a culturally diverse Shia Muslim community living in over 25 countries around the world, headed by His Highness Prince Karim Al Husseini Aga Khan, the 49th hereditary Imam of the Shia Imami Ismaili Muslims in direct descent from the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. We adhere to a long tradition of commitment to a search for knowledge and for the betterment of self and society. And we embrace pluralism by building bridges of peace and understanding and generously sharing of our time, talents, and material resources in order to improve the quality of life for the community 
and for those amongst whom we live. Our work globally is carried out through the initiatives of the various Ismaili communities through Ismaili Civic, as well as the Aga Khan Development Network, a contemporary endeavor of the Ismaili Imamat through which the social conscious of Islam finds practical expression. In the UK, for a small community, the Ismailis punch well above their weight, with members of the community holding leading positions in world-class organizations and companies, ranging from finance, law, accounting, health, education, amongst others. As well, a considerable number of the community are engaged in entrepreneurial activities very successfully, thereby providing employment as well as contributing to the UK Treasury. We're in areas of real estate, hospitality, care homes, as well as retail. And we come together to share best practice as well as scale through alliances that have been established over many years. We are delighted to have a strong relationship with the KPMG, who have been our well-wishers and supporters over many years. And tonight, it is our pleasure to have Denis Tartakov here to speak about the economic outlook for the UK and the, and the world. Dennis is a senior economist at KPMG in the UK, and he works alongside the chief economist of KPMG to generate research and thought leadership covering a diverse range of topics, including global economic growth, labor markets, and the economic impacts of climate change. His most recent research projects explore the economic impacts of the pandemic on the UK's economic geography. Dennis holds an MPhil in economics from the University of Oxford and a BSc in economics from the University of St. Andrews. It is my distinct pleasure to invite Dennis to come to the podium. Um, well, well, thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for joining um, joining us here tonight. It's, it's uh, lovely to see so many of you here in person uh, interested in, in economics. Uh, my, my talk tonight is really going to cover the, the short-term outlook for the UK economy as we deal with the effects of the the squeeze on consumer incomes, the high inflation. And also, I, I, will, I will have a little bit of time at the end to look at more at what the more long-term trends are, what the new normal is as we emerge from the effects of the pandemic and we, we really return back to normal, normal steady-state growth. We have a chart here of uh, the UK GDP as well as forecasts, and, and all of this is in quarterly level uh, quarterly levels you can quite clearly see the big uh, dip in UK GDP early on in 2020 caused by uh, the COVID pandemic and a smaller dip uh, starting in 2021 from the lockdown uh, that started in January that year you can see quite quite clearly the rapid recovery the UK economy has, has undergone since then and also that as we get to the start of 2022, as we get to our current moment, uh, we're exhausting that potential for recovery as the economy is reaching uh, pre-pandemic levels of output. So from now on, you're seeing much flatter trajectory for UK GDP, so slower growth for the coming two years. And to some extent, this is also being impacted by uh, the war in Ukraine, which according to our estimates, is taking about 0.4 to 0.5 percentage points of growth uh, this year and the next. Looking further to the right of that chart, you can see a slight dip in, in UK GDP later on in 2023. This is our estimate of the impact for the ending of the uh, government super deduction scheme, 
which is going to have quite a big effect on the timing of investment. Not so much on the total level, because uh, business investments are just going to be shifted from later on in the year to coincide with the policy, but that creates this, this very uneven profile uh, that we're seeing there. Now, the big, the big impact and the big driver of the economy uh, coming into this year was, of course, uh, the effect on supply chains. Bef at least before the war, uh, before the war began, later in, fe in February, this was the primary driver, the big driver behind escalating costs, rising inflation, and uh, slowing growth in some sectors, particularly the automotive uh, sector. And at least coming into this year, we were starting to see some of these supply chain issues starting to be resolved, and indicators were pointing to to some improvements. Now, the cause of this was. Uh, really caused by the pandemic during the period of lockdown when consumption had to, or cons consumption in services was not possible. Consumers' households shifted towards consuming more goods, and the global economy was struggling to generate that level of output and to deliver it to consumers. So this created the issues we were seeing uh, towards the end, tail end and beginning of this year. Now, what's changed since then, since the war began, we're likely to see further disruption in supply chains, particularly supply chains uh, which are uh, passing through the region. This has already affected some automotive production. We're expecting big uh, potential impacts on uh, uh, chip production as well, because neon uh, uh, is a component in the, manuf in the manufacturing of machines that produce microchips. So further disruption there is, is, is possible. Furthermore, lockdowns in China, the zero COVID policy is also having a big effect, affect uh, large, uh, large uh, sections of the economy are being disrupted, and that's likely to contribute to further disruption later this year. So some good news in the sense that some of the disruption we were seeing last year were starting to ease, but also new problems. And these new problems are likely to persist with, with us uh, as, as long as the, uh, the conflict continues and as long as production from the region is, is disrupted. Um, but the really the big impact of the invasion and the big impact that, that we really want to cover is the impact on energy prices. Uh, Russia itself is a large exporter of commodities, exporter of energy goods. And so what we are seeing is a big, uh, big response from the prices of these commodities. So you can already see the huge amount of volatility on oil, in oil prices, uh, driving um, uh, fuel prices, prices at the tank to unprecedented levels. You can see some of the, the market futures on this, but again, the, the actual current volatility seems to be uh, the dominant factor. And even in terms of levels, uh, the wholesale price levels that we're seeing here are almost, almost double what we were seeing last year. So again, a big contributor to inflation and one that passes through into consumer prices very quickly. So it affects consumers uh, with a very small lag. Now, the second big driver, and the one we've been hearing a lot about, is, of course, gas prices and gas prices for the UK. Again, you can see this volatility uh, during the winter months of this year. And you can see the 54% increase in energy uh, tariffs that has already been announced, has already taken, has already taken place. And looking at these... Uh, and the market futures or wholesale gas prices, we could see another increase later on in October. And of course, what happens in what happens with supplies from Russia is is crucial, is a is a key factor in this. Um, I think there was already news um, an hour ago, potentially some supplies being interrupted, so we could see a big another big response. So take the take any specific numbers you're seeing here with a grain of salt because this is likely to change very quickly on an almost daily basis. Um, and this is a chart we do, have, we do end up having to update very frequently uh, given, given the volatility that we're seeing. Now, in terms of 
which affecting the economy, this, this kind of spike in energy prices is affecting those on lowest incomes the most. For them, energy makes up a larger proportion of their overall household expenditure, and so having to devote a much larger share towards energy is, is clearly uh, going to affect their overall capacity to spend. Um, however, in addition to this, so there, there is a, a slight estimate there for the potential impact in October. Of, of course, that's, that's highly uncertain and depends to some extent on what kind of measures the Treasury has on offer uh, as, as we go into the winter months. Now, on top of this, you also have to add the overall rising tax burden, which is affecting, again, affecting all, uh, all levels of society uh, and negatively. Despite the, the tax cuts announced in the spring statement, the overall uh, change, which is taking the pre-announced tax increases into account, is for all sections of the, uh, the income distribution to, to see a net decrease in their overall available, uh, available incomes. Um, so, putting this together, what we're actually seeing is a historically large, uh, almost 2% fall in overall household disposable income. So, a huge fall in available resources that consumers have to spend, and this could be translated almost directly into their, their actual spending. Now, in, in real terms, in, in reality, households will tend to seek to, to smooth their consumption, to try to use savings to uh, run them down during this period and try to keep their consumption levels constant. But at least for those uh, households at the lower end of the income distribution, they might be constrained in the amount of borrowing they can, uh, they can access. For them, the reduction in available resources uh, points to almost almost directly into a reduction in consumption. So a very very difficult situation. And as you can see, even on a, such a, a long historical scale, completely unprecedented. Um, the word the whole word unprecedented might have been overused over the past three years, but you know, we're, we're repeatedly coming into situations where, for which we have no. Uh, no recent historical analogies. Now, this has already generated uh, an almost uh, this tremendous collapse in consumer confidence. You can see the, the dark blue line on the chart in front of you, uh, really to levels comparable to what we saw during the, um, the peak period of the pandemic. So really a significant drop and, and really very, very broad based, so covering uh, all indicators of the sub-index, so both their outlook for the economy, outlook for their own household finances. So consumer confidence really uh, suffering sharply. And, and you can also uh, kind of contrast this with business confidence. It still, seems, still needs to catch up, so businesses are still not quite realizing the, the situation that's happening, but I think, I, I'm sure that given enough time, we'll see those, those indicators kind of move, move, start to move more in line with each other. Now, what this means for the, overall, for the overall pattern of consumption is that households will start to shift, to start to prioritize their consumption towards essential goods. They'll try to uh, limit spending on any luxuries, any delayable spending. And, and broadly, that is something that we are already starting to see. So the next chart, uh, as soon as it appears, will start to show of credit card and debit card spending. And you can see really the, the line that I'd like to draw your attention to is the red line showing the delayable spending and how over this time it's consistently, it's actually moved to the very bottom of the, um, the, the, other, the other lines. Um, so consumers are starting to prioritize or will be prioritizing staple, uh, consumption of staples, will be looking to cut costs in, in various areas and limit their consumption. So that's, that's the kind of environment that we are entering at least for the next six months until we can start to see uh, some recovery. Uh, so the overall picture for inflation is we're expecting it to be higher, to be much more persistent uh, than we had expected before. So uh, the, the chart here shows just how much our forecasts have shifted uh, 
since about two months ago before the conflict, uh, before the invasion of Ukraine really began. We were factoring in a big spike in inflation to come in April, so this month, followed by sort of a gradual decline as the rest of the, as those prices were, were being reflected and the, uh, the overall 12 month comparison moved to, to incorporate all the recent increases we've seen before. What we're seeing now is this much more, uh, much more prolonged peak, much higher peak, lasting potentially towards the end of this year before inflation then starts to fall. The reasons are very similar, but again, just the in increase in energy prices in October is sort of the, the, the tail end of that plateau. And during the intervening months, we're starting to see more and more inflation from the conflict feeding into consumer prices. And the kind of factors we are starting, will be seeing will be the impact of commodity prices, so higher metals prices affecting overall uh, uh, production costs, food prices going up, both through the costs of foods, uh, foodstuffs themselves and higher costs of fertilizers, which are likely to be much, actually much more persistent given that they'll be affecting the price of food produced in this year's harvest, which will be um, available later on. And, uh, of course, supply disruptions will be, uh, will be in play throughout this period, again, pushing inflation upwards. Now, the good news is that we do still think that eventually this, this period of high inflation will be transitory, although I think this word is, is becoming less, uh, less popular in use. You know, it's transitory, but it is lasting for a very long time. And inflation will eventually come down closer to the Bank of England's target of 2% by the end of 2024. Of course, that assumption requires that domestic inflation in the UK doesn't uh, start to take this current, these currently high levels into account and doesn't really start to feed off itself. So as so long as expectations among households and firms and, and, policy and, and uh, wage setters in the UK remain anchored close to the 2% target, we should, we, we, should be, we should be in the clear. And the main or, or the, the key driver of this will be uh, policy by, uh, policies by the Bank of England. So we are expecting uh, two more interest rate rises to happen this year, potentially coming in May and also in August to coincide with the monetary policy uh, reports which will give the bank an opportunity to explain, explain their reasoning, uh, and then potentially another increase in February. Uh, in comparison to market expectations, uh, we're, we're slightly more dovish than the current market expectations. You can see the, the light green line. But it seems to be that the Bank of England should be a lot more cautious in the current environment, uh, seeking and uh, really bringing, as long as the inflation is brought to target in the medium term, there's very little that the Bank of England uh, would be able to do uh, to, for current inflation. So current inflation is already in train, and it will be high, uh, no matter of the uh, course of policy adopted here. Now, of course, this will have a big impact on the housing market. Uh, you can see how it's very, well, at least in the recent years, how volatile it has been, driven primarily by uh, different deadlines of the uh, support policies announced by Treasury, so stamp duty holidays, uh, variously ending at different periods of the year, causing these big fluctuations in a number of transactions. But overall, you can see that contrary to economic logic, where you would expect house prices to fall or, or at least uh, not rise during a, a big recession like we've seen during the pandemic. We've seen just the opposite. House prices increasing quite rapidly. Big changes in um, what people are looking for from the housing market. So, uh, so quite big changes associated with uh, access to hybrid working and uh, reevaluating the desirability of different areas. And we think that's going to continue. So even while household incomes are falling, uh, interest rates are rising, so these big affordability factors are very much, very much negative for house price growth. 
we will keep seeing the the overall reallocation of uh, real, relocation of preferences. So as workers become more accustomed to hybrid working, they can reevaluate where they're located relative to their workplace. They can re reevaluate their own choices within that, and we can start to see certain areas become singled out as much more desirable than in the past. Of course, the overall housing stock is, is largely fixed, so the primary, the primary variable that will start to change will be prices. So it will be prices, relative prices of uh, houses with gardens versus, for example, uh, city flats. Um, and as, as you can see, unlike the, the other variables where we're not quite brave enough to offer our own forecast for what might happen in the housing market, but given it is, it is as volatile as it has been, it would be, would be very difficult. Now, uh, I'm going to turn now to the labor market, where, yeah, yeah. where we have seen a lot of good news uh, recently. We know that uh, throughout the pandemic, the furlough scheme was extremely effective at like sort of reducing the the response from the unemployment rate, keeping the unemployment rate down. There was some uh, some worry that as the furlough scheme would be withdrawn, we could see an increase in the unemployment rate potentially potentially spike uh, afterwards, which we haven't seen at all. And instead, what we have seen is a is a, an enormous shortage of labour, uh, driving the unemployment rate down uh, and keeping it fairly low and very, very close to historic, historically low levels. Uh, we think that's going to continue over the next few months, or at least the next, next six months, until eventually the slowdown in the economy, the slowdown in growth, sees the, kind of the slowdown in overall labor demand growth, which should see the unemployment rate return back closer to around 4%. So very close to what we think is the... Um, and the equilibrium, the, the more structural uh, level of the unemployment rate, and gradually the current labor shortages we're seeing should, should dissipate. Uh, but the reason we are seeing these shortages is uh, so several. So we, we are seeing workers being much more confident to, uh, to switch jobs. Uh, and you can see this is actually not, not a UK, not a purely UK story, so, so you can... So while Brexit is a contributing factor, uh, we're seeing a very similar, uh, similar set of data coming from the US. So workers are much more confident to switch jobs. It's uh, driving uh, higher, higher wage growth, higher pay growth uh, throughout, this, throughout the labor market. However, even taking the, uh, uh, these kinds of dynamics into account, the current pace of wage growth is still pointing to negative real wage growth. So overall, overall pay is uh, is negative, and, and that's what's contributing to the to the squeeze of overall household finances. Now, uh, the main reason for this labour shortage has been the the way workers have tended to leave the the labour market during the pandemic. So. Other than Brexit, the main factor has been this labor force participation rate, uh, which has tended to, um, to decrease over this period, particularly as older workers uh, left the labor force. Uh, this means that it will likely take some time for the, um, the overall shortage to, to be resolved, and, and throughout this period we could see some, some above average uh, uh, pay pressures. Now, uh, the next couple of slides will look at the, the outlook for public finances. I've already mentioned the, the impact of the spring statement on personal taxes, which have seen an increase. But overall, what we are seeing from fiscal policy is the tax burden, the tax burden on the UK economy really rising to unprecedented levels. Uh, the OBR predict that it will reach 36% uh, of GDP which, uh, looking at this, this period of over 50 years, is, is almost unprecedented for, for modern UK uh, economic history. Now, what this is 
leading to is a fairly rapid reduction in the overall deficit. So public finances are on a fairly sustainable footing. They're returning back to very sustainable levels. And, and what this means is that we're not expecting debt to increase at, in, in any uh, reasonable way after the increases we've already seen. And those increases were purely driven by the pandemic itself. And you can see here that even as the increases to just under 100% of GDP, overall debt will then start to start to decline as the uh, public finances become that much more uh, sustainable. And what this does mean is that Treasury does still have some room and some space over the next few uh, uh, fiscal events to increase the level of support on offer to try to shield households from the economic shocks that the economy is is undergoing and try to protect the, uh, the, the well-being of consumers. So I think on, on that we may see some, some announcement in the near future or over the summer, especially if uh, the situation around wholesale prices uh, for energy deteriorates in any appreciable way. I think the, the next slide, I think I go through this quite quickly, but really summarizes our overall annual forecast. Um, you can see the GDP is set to grow by 4% this year. This, this feels somewhat at odds with the picture I, I described to you earlier of, of slowing growth and, and weak, uh, weak economy. But what this really reflects is just the recovery from what we saw in, in 2021. So GDP was much weaker uh, in the previous year, so even though it's not growing this year, it is generating this what looks like rapid growth, but actually just um, a fairly lukewarm growth in reality. Uh, 2023 sees a much more significant uh, slowdown to 1.1%, so this is even slower than what we would expect uh, on average in, in the potential new normal. Consumer spending, similar story, so the 4.5% growth you're seeing there really reflects the recovery from the previous year, exactly the same as overall GDP. Um, it's really not, not much more to, to cover off there. And then investment, the reduction in 23 is just the timing of the super deduction scheme that I've already, already outlined. On the unemployment rate, uh, it's forecast to stay fairly close to 4%. I think 4.3% for 2023 might be an average figure, but uh, at the moment, it's, it is quite uncertain, and we're, we're, it's likely to stay at 4.2, 4, 4, between 4 and 4.3 percent is, is fairly reasonable. Um, and on inflation, very rapid, or very rapid growth in prices of 8.2 percent this year. This is an average figure, with the overall uh, peak somewhere around between 9 and 10 percent, and, and then declining to 3.9 percent in 2023, and then kind of. Uh, slowly heading back to target afterwards, so just above 2% is, is fairly reasonable. And then interest rates, just as I've, outl as I've outlined, uh, reaching 1.5% by the end of next year. Um, now, the next couple of slides, I just want to cover off a few of the factors that could be big, big transformative factors for the overall structure of the UK economy. So things that were the so trends that we're seeing that will really change how the new normal in the economy looks compared to pre-pandemic. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go through these quite quickly, and I have just a few illustrative, uh, illustrative charts, but the charts themselves aren't necessarily essential, so really to follow what's, what's going on. Well, what we have seen is, first of all, a big shift to digital. So online shopping, um, really, exploded uh, compared to pre-pandemic or during the pandemic months. And a lot of consumers would have uh, ingrained new habits, new preferences towards how they uh, approach uh, retail. So you can see that there's this huge spike in, in overall online retail activity. And we're likely to see that continue. So, so the pandemic, a big uh, transformative push towards how uh, consumers interact, or how consumers approach their, um, uh, their their chosen consumption trends. The second big shift we're likely to see is the the changes brought on by remote working. 
Uh, we've looked into how different towns and cities are likely to be affected, particularly as, as office-based businesses move towards more uh, remote or hybrid forms of work. Now, the conclusions are actually quite, uh, not very, by themselves, are not, not necessarily straightforward because on the face of it, you might think that the economies of big cities that focus on office-based businesses and office-based work would be the most negatively affected. But then the next step that would likely happen in this kind of situation is that businesses would likely consolidate. So rather than keeping uh, excess, excess levels of floor space that are essentially going unused, they would consolidate around some prime locations. And I think our, our own estimates, our own, um, our own scenario on what might happen says that a lot of these prime locations are actually themselves located in cities. So you might see in the hollowing out of peripheral areas of, of uh, office space outside of these prime locations, but actually prime locations themselves coming out ahead, and you have this kind of uh, two, two levels of recovery with with central areas actually coming out quite well in this, so actually benefiting from remote working. Um, so that, that's, that's one potential shift that we could see there. Of course, other shifts towards more, a more local consumption if, uh, if workers are spending more of their time at their home location rather than the office location, the actual uh, geographical spread of where that spending takes place starts to be very different uh, compared to what we were seeing before. And again, you could see um, areas benefiting from both of these changes at once and areas losing out, so uh, really quite close to one another. So the, the, the chart there, the areas in green potentially benefiting, areas in red potentially losing out. But of course, this is just, just one potential scenario on this. And, and the last big trend, the last big influence on, on how the economy is going to perform is, is of course, the, the impact of the climate emergency. We've, uh, we commissioned a piece of work uh, over the summer looking at the potential uh, economic impacts of investment in green innovation. And, and some of the findings really were, were quite surprising. Um, looking at patent filings and overall economic growth over the past 20, 25 years, uh, uh, researchers are finding that really investment in green innovation generates at least as much growth, if not more, than uh, innovation in, in other areas. So actually what we're seeing is, given the, the situation with where we are with the climate emergency, it doesn't mean that it has to necessarily come at the expense of growth in the future. So green innovation can generate economic growth and, and it can actually generate quite big, uh, quite big returns in this area. Now, that's, that's really all I have from the slides for now. Uh, I'd love to invite uh, Chairman Selim to the podium to uh, say a few words and close the evening. What a spectacular presentation. Well, thank you, Dennis. Please join me in a round of applause for Dennis and for Thank you. I think we can all agree that this discussion has, res has resulted in us being better informed and better engaged with the current status of, the, of economy affairs and the issues facing the economy, especially given the impact of, the, of stark macroeconomic events such as high inflation, resulting in a high interest rate environment, highlighted that this is a global issue with the impact being firmly felt within the United Kingdom. This is further reiterated to us that reviewing our budgets curtailing spending where possible, minimizing borrowing, and optimizing savings is more relevant and sound advice than ever before. For businesses, similar advice applies. Given the challenges associated with higher costs of inventory, labor, and energy, switching from fixed costs to variable costs, improving on-the-job on training, with cheaper labor sources and looking towards investment in technological improvements should help ease the burden of the rising cost environment. 
In order to traverse these challenging times, the EPP is here to help. We are running numerous programs to support businesses and individuals with personal financial planning and employment support. In the coming months, we will be launching the Ismaili Professional Network and Business Alliance. Additionally, our virtual clinics started yesterday and will run weekly on Mondays going forward. Finally, coming back to tonight's event, I would sincerely like to take this opportunity to thank Dennis and the KPMG team for the invaluable time, knowledge and insights that they have afforded us this evening in what to be hope is a long-standing relationship and friendship with the Smiley community. To all the members of the Arakan Economic Planning Board who put in countless hours to make this event such a success, to the numerous volunteers here tonight, without whom this event could not have gone ahead, thank you. And thank you also very much to the audience for asking such engaging questions. The AKPB would also like to invite you to our next event to be held on the 26th of May, a masterclass in intergenerational planning. In attendance, we will have experts from Investment House and James's Place who will share their expertise on the importance of wealth planning, looking at topics such as inheritance tax planning, wills and trusts. The event will be held here at the Smiley Centre. Look out for information on how to register on Al Saha or the Smiley app. We look, we look forward to seeing you then. All that it leads me to say is thank you to all those who have joined us virtually and good night. And to those present here, please do join us for some refreshment and time to network and to wish you all a safe journey home. Thank you, Yali Mother and Kudafis.